It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. The White House has a listening session that drives my blood pressure up. Uh, we'll find out while one, while, why one Netherlands regulator quit his job in protest. Another QNAP mess. And finally, it had to happen someday. <sighs> Fishing as a service. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 888, recorded 13 September 2022. The Evil Proxy Service. Security Now is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Going online without ExpressVPN is like leaving your laptop exposed at the coffee shop table while you run to the bathroom. Secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash security now and get an extra three months free on a one-year package. And by Thinkst Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code TWIT in the How Did You Hear About Us box. And by New Relic. Use the data platform made for the curious. Right now, you can get access to the whole New Relic platform and 100 gigabytes of data per month free forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash security now. It's time for security now. Yes, he's here, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Gibson. He didn't sleep well last night, but he's going to sleep like a baby tonight because it's security now day. Hello, Steve. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he told me he sleeps better when the show's done. Like you, you put a lot of stress into this, right? Well, it's okay. So I monitor the phases of my sleep. Remember the ZOs that I had yeah, you yeah. get yeah. Like years ago? I still have it. Uh, you Well, it may come in handy uh, <laughs> that... It, it turns out that the amount of slow wave sleep we get, which is a, which is the deepest level of sleep, um, it correlates with how with, with basically it's a response from the previous day's cognitive memorization related work. Hmm. And they've they've done tests where they've taken two groups of people who are well mixed and had them both spend the day doing two different types of task. One, which involves memorization, and the other, also a mental task, but did not require memory. And the, the amount of slow-wave sleep obtained by the group who are trying to memorize things is significantly larger than the group that did an equal amount of work but didn't require memory. It's during slow wave sleep that memories are transferred from temporary storage into permanent storage. And and what's interesting is that it's all, that's also the only cycle, the only phase of our sleep where the 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 toxic proteins, the amyloid betas and the tau proteins are are swept out of our brain. So one wonders whether, you know, the old adage about like learning a language or exposing yourself to novelty, if the reason that tends to keep your brain healthy is that our brain's response to that load we're putting on it, like a memorization load, learning something new, is to give us more slow wave sleep, which has the effect of clearing out the, the metabolic uh, the debris from the previous day's work. Hence, you should never stop doing this show. <laughs> this show is good for you. Oh, hence, I need to keep finding authors like the new author that I just found. <laughs> oh, good books oh, are worth too. <laughs> oh, are you still anyway, reading we, him? We, You're like crazy about oh, him. We'll talk I've, about I've him got later, a section of our show notes to oh, talk good. about Can't him. Wait. Yes. What else are we going to so cover? So we're, we're at uh, episode 888 for the 13th of September. Um, this was titled The Evil Proxy Service. And oh boy. <laughs> you know, the, Bruce Schneier's words about attacks never getting worse, they only ever get better or stronger. They really ring true here. Anyway, we've got something really interesting and upsetting to, <laughs> to talk about. Uh, but 
First, we're going to look at an unusual and disturbing escalation of a cyber attack. I hope not an indicator of things to come. Uh, I also note that crypto heists have become so pervasive that I'm not mentioning them much anymore. It's just, they're just, it's ridiculous. We'll like, talk about like that. Like breaches. It's the same thing. It's just so yes. many. Yes. Also, the, the White House on uh, last Thursday conducted a listening session, as they called it, to dump on today's powerful tech platforms. Some of what Ugh. came from that was interesting. And a government regulator in the Netherlands quit his position and then told us why. Also, there's another QNAP mess, which is bad enough to exceed my already quite high QNAP mess discussion threshold. Uh, normally, I just don't talk about it anymore because it's like, okay, uh, again. Anyway, also, D-Link routers need to be sh very sure that they've been that they are now running the latest firmware. I'll explain why. I've got, as I mentioned, another comment about my latest sci-fi author discovery, two quick, quick bits of feedback from our listeners, and then we're going to examine this uh, essentially phishing as a service oh, has golly. happened. Inevitable. In the same way Inevitable. That, in this, yes, it isn't exactly that, Leo. In the same way we had ransomware as a service, now we have phishing as a service, and this service can bypass all of our multi-factor authentication safeguards. Oh, boy. That's not good. So Oy. it is the essentially the, the conceptual cousin of ransomware in a service, and oh, do we have a picture of the week? Um, <laughs> I burst out <laughs> laughing when I saw it. It's good. It's good. <laughs> All right. Well, we have lots to get to, uh, and we will do that in a moment as soon as we talk about our sponsor of the hour, Express VPN. You know, I'll never forget this. We, Lisa and I were in Japan at a McDonald's in Japan because they didn't want the bento box, they wanted a Big Mac. And uh, we're sitting there, and a woman is sitting at a table. She's eating her McDonald's burger and uh, gets up to go to the bathroom. Leaves her purse right there. And Lisa and I are looking at each other. We're looking at the purse. But what we found out is, and this is in Tokyo, it is so safe in Japan that you can, in fact, leave your purse and go to the bathroom, and it will be there safe. In fact... Uh, you know, if you leave your wallet behind, somebody will come running after you saying, your wallet, your wallet. Very honest. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing this in any other country in the world. And, I, you know, if you are using the Internet without ExpressVPN, it's basically like you're at a coffee shop and you're going to go to the bathroom and just leave your laptop there. Oh, and might as well leave it logged in, right? Most of the time... Nobody's going to mess with you. Maybe you'll be in Tokyo and it'll be okay. But what if one day you come out of the bathroom, your laptop's gone, or worse, you don't even know it, but they've stolen all your data, your passwords, everything. That's what it's like if you're on the internet with that ExpressVPN. You need a VPN when you connect to an unencrypted network. What it does is it encrypts it. Very simple. That's cafes, that's hotels, cruise ships, airports. Anybody on the same network can gain access to your personal data, passwords, financial details, etc. as they float unencrypted through the sky. It doesn't take a lot of technical knowledge. Just some inexpensive hardware. Frankly, uh, a smart 12-year-old could do it. Your data is valuable. Your laptop is valuable. Hackers can make a lot of money selling personal information about you on the dark web. E even, you know, more subtle and worse than that, Darren kitchen at hack five sells a little thing called the wi-fi pineapple little device you hook up to your laptop you go to a coffee shop and if you're a bad guy you can use this wi-fi pineapple to snoop on all the laptops out there and do some really evil things for instance you can see that laptops on the network even if they're you know encrypting their email password you can see what its favorite access points are and you can see the one that's your home. And then you can impersonate the home access point. And your laptop, being the goofball that it is, says, hey, we're home. Join the network. Now your data is going through the hacker's Wi-Fi, pineapple, and laptop out to the outside world. So being visible on a network is not a good thing. The good news is you're not when you use ExpressVPN. You're invisible because you're an encrypted tunnel. 
A hacker can see there's something going on, but they can't see your machine. They can't see you. They don't know it's you. And, of course, they can't steal your data. They can't attack you with a Wi-Fi pineapple. The encryption is, of course, strong encryption. That means it's basically undefeatable. It'd take a bad guy with a supercomputer a billion years to get in. So you don't have to worry about that. The other thing, though, and I always point this out, is you're now trusting the VPN provider, right? Because everything's going through them and then got out into the real world. So it's very important you choose carefully. That's why I use ExpressVPN. That's why I tell you to use ExpressVPN. They are absolutely safe they don't log your presence and we know they don't do this because from time to time uh, nation states with uh, without laws like ours without warrants will come seize the servers happened in turkey from express vpn expecting to get lots of data about its users from it and there's nothing on there they developed a really cool specialized version of the debian linux distro that automatically resets itself on every reboot which they do daily they use a special server they call it the trusted server that lives in ram is sandbox can't write to the drive so when you're using express vpn the minute you close that connection it's gone and so is every evidence of you existing and it's but that doesn't mean it's hard for you to use you put the app it's on everything you can even put it on some routers so your whole household is protected you press a button you're protected Phones, laptops, tablets, stay secure no matter where you are, on the go or at home. Because you know what? Your ISP spies on you too. Secure your online data today. Visit expressvpn.com slash security now. E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash security now. You don't need to use a VPN all the time. But on the other hand, ExpressVPN is so fast, so easy to use. Why not? Just leave it on and you'll always be secured. Right now, get an extra three months free with your one-year package. Makes it less than seven bucks a month. By the way, you do not want a free VPN. You want to pay for it. They take that money. They invest it in infrastructure. They invest it in rotating IP addresses. They do all the things you need to do to be a good VPN. It's not cheap to run a VPN. I think less than seven bucks a month is a very, very good price for the best VPN out there. ExpressVPN.com slash security now. Now... We get to see that thing that made me laugh out loud. So the the residential version of this is that old story. Uh, you'd have to be uh, you'd have to be our age or older, probably oh, yeah. Leo, to to remember when fuses were screw in base uh, in homes. Right, the the, the actual fuse. The, the actual, there weren't circuit breakers so much back then that the, they were l very much like a lamp socket, but you would screw a fuse, which was round yes. and it would have, you know, a, a little, a little piece of copper there in the middle. And of course the point was that if something downstream of the fuse was drawing so much current that it was it, that, that the, the little fuse, thus it's called a fuse would 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 overheat and melt well you wanted that to happen because the melting opened the circuit <laughs> and yes. tur turned off the current yeah and so so you at, at, as a per, as an engineer you know as as a technical person the idea and, and what people would do of course is like you know th things would happen uh, the fuses could you don't get have old, a fuse right it, yeah. it could just sort of yeah. yeah you don't have a fuse handy because you used them up you used the fuse the last time it blew yeah. that was your last fuse <laughs> and so and you forgot to go get some more but the lights are off so what are you going to do well you get a copper penny and you stick it in the socket, and then you screw the burned out fuse on top of it, and oh look, the lights come back on. Yeah, and you well, just you know, and you better hope the next surge is so powerful it melts the penny. Yeah, and and you know, again, so okay, all this by way of introducing our picture of the week, which is the equivalent <laughs> on an industrial scale. <laughs> oh my God. If anyone has ever seen like a fuse box that would be protecting a huge, like a, a, a woodworking shop with a bunch of equipment in it, or so, something that's drawing, you know, like like an oil derrick or something, where the the fuses the, the fuses are cylinders with big thick copper 
um, blades on each end. And you stick them in, and 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 the blades are grabbed by by uh, receptacles on either end. And there's a pair of them for the hot and the cold line. Uh, anyway, in, in this picture, apparently because something similar happened, uh, they ran out of fuses. Maybe they were <laughs> stolen. Maybe you know they kept blowing out. Well, first of all, if your fuses keep blowing out, there's yeah, there's good. something wrong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, these these industrious people decided, okay, well, you know, these pesky fuses keep blowing out. So they, they took two very large screwdrivers and just stuck them in <laughs> in place of these fuses. And boy, I tell you, if these fuses blow, You're you trouble. really have some problems. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's Whoa. hysterical. Oh, that, I have those screwdrivers. I, now that I know I can use them as fuses, I'm set. That's good. Actually, I own the one on the right. Yeah, me I too. Actually, Who doesn't? That's I absolutely a own that. Yeah. I, that yeah. Yes. That thing must be a popular screwdriver because yeah. both, of, both, both yeah. of us have one. <laughs> okay. So, Albania versus Iran. Uh, Risky Business News headlined their story this way. They said, Albania cuts diplomatic ties with Iran in the first ever cyber-related escalation. Uh, you know, I don't have a strong emotional tie to either Albania or Iran, though it's worth noting that Albania is a member of NATO. Fortunately, at this time, cyber war mostly amounts to, you know, transient inconveniences, right? Like, you know, some office can't process green cards or something. Uh, but what's so worrisome about this is that it feels as though it might be predictive of worse things to come, um, you know, and eventually perhaps involving global scale adversaries. OK, anyway, so here's what happened. The Albanian government announced last Wednesday, the 7th, that it would be cutting all all diplomatic relations with Iran in the aftermath of a major cyber attack. And this marks the first time ever that a cyber attack has escalated this severely in the political realm. In a recorded video statement published on YouTube, for anyone who's interested, I have the link in the show notes, Albania's Prime Minister, uh, Edi Rama, said that after concluding an investigation into the incident, they found indisputable evidence that Iranian state-sponsored hackers were behind the cyber attack that took place nearly two months prior on July 15th. So they didn't just jump at this immediately. They did some investigating. In fact, they involved Microsoft. Uh, that cyber attack crippled multiple Albanian government IT systems. Rama gave Iranian diplomats one day, 24 hours, to close their embassy and clear out, while the Iranian government naturally denied any involvement in the attack. NATO, the U.S. White House, and the U.K. government all published statements in support of the Albanian government and supported its attribution of the attack to the Tehran regime. The U.S. called Iran's attack on its NATO ally a troubling precedent and promised to, quote, take further action to hold Iran accountable. And I did see subsequently, but I didn't track it down, that the U.S. had announced sanctions on Iran specifically due to this attack, this cyber attack on Albania. Um, and, of course, although Iranian op officials uh, may, delight, may deny their involvement. The proof lies in the malware used, which was discovered in the July 15th attack. Both Mandiant and Microsoft have um, linked back to multiple past instances of Iranian cyber espionage operations and tooling using the same stuff. Microsoft which has participated, as I said, in the Albanian government's response to the incident, said it was able to link the incident to four different Iranian APTs, you know, Advanced Persistent Threat Groups, and detailed how these four groups have been working together to breach Albanian government networks at least since last year 
to establish the proverbial foothold. Then finally in July, uh, under the auspices of the Iranian government, which apparently decided it was time to act, the, the, the attack was launched. Microsoft says the four groups appear to work under the guidance and control of the I- Iran Minister of Intelligence and Security, MOIS. The, the four groups with numerical designations, there's DEV0842, which deployed the ransomware and the wiper malware. DEV0861, a different group, gained initial access and exfiltrated data. So now we're seeing you know, specialization among individually identified groups. We have DEV0166, which exfiltrated the data, and DEV0133, the group which probed the victim's infrastructure initially. So both Mandiant, which, by the way, Google, remember, purchased in March for $5.4 billion, and Microsoft concur in their statement that the Iranian attack is directly connected to the Albanian government's harboring thousands of Iranian dissidents, part of an exiled opposition party named uh, the People's uh, Muhaj. How do you say it? Uh, Muhad- M- Mudajin? Muhadajin? Something like that. Anyway, organiza- I meant to, to look up the pronunciation before the podcast and I forgot. Anyway, also known as MEK, which I like to say much easy, more easily. Um, at the request of the U.S. government, MEK was given shelter in Albania in 2016 after the Iranian regime declared the group a terrorist organization and started hunting its members. MEK members were planning to hold an annual summit on July 21st, but that summit, which was titled the Free Iran World Summit, was canceled because of terrorist and bomb threats. Microsoft says that the threats and the Cyber 15th cyber attacks were part of a broader effort from the Iranian government to go after the group and its host country. So, whereas past operations typically involve coordinated social media campaigns, data leaks, vague threats, and declarations from Iranian officials, the deployment of a data wiper and ransomware appears to have crossed a line, which Albanian and NATO officials are not taking quietly, though Albania's prime minister tried to play down the aftermath aftermath of the July 15th attack and said the government system's were now restored, the attack crippled government operations and official websites for weeks. And in fact, moments after Iranian officials left the embassy, Albanian police raided the building, which is unusual, in search of any incriminating evidence that might have um, survived, you know, the typical hard drive bashing and document burning practices of fleeing diplomats. Conducting this raid was seen as extreme, But the general sentiment is that NATO partners backed and pushed Albania into this action as a way to signal to other cyber aggressive countries that a line is being crossed when entire government IT networks are being wiped just because someone wants to attack a dissident group that they're annoyed with. And, of course, attack those who are harboring the group. I think that's appropriate. I really do. Don't you? Which you have to, to draw to, a line in the sand. No, no. Oh, defend, yes. Yeah, oh, yes. To say no, no. To draw the line. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, you know, this shall not pass. And Leo, I mean, we're the, the thing that's worrisome about this, as I started off saying, is that you know, what if this is a harbinger? Like, what if you know? I mean, we, we've talked about how weird it is that like the U.S. and China are apparently right now involved in you know percolating kind of going on in the background cyber attacks against each other well the problem is cyber is becoming sorry to use that term in isolation leo uh uh (laughs) the cyber world is becoming cyberspace uh, man (laughs) it is you know it's becoming where the world operates yeah and so attacks there are real attacks. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Increasingly. And, and they yeah, can so I, be deadly. I mean, it's it's no reason to treat it any less seriously than a yeah, rocket and, and a mortar attack, I think. you know? Right, right. 
And, and so I, I agree with you completely. I, I think that that it is it is good you need a that, proportional that, response. That, that the, yes, that the world said, okay, yeah. uh, this is not all right. right. You know, we know it was you, Iran. We know why you did it. We know you're not happy. We don't agree with your unhappiness. And you've just attacked a member of NATO. So there's Sorry. even if it yeah. was a cyber attack. Yeah. Now, I understand the risk is that it will escalate into it, you know, worse and worse back and forth. But I don't see any way out of that. Uh, this is the this is the whole, you know, this is the whole issue of any military force. You have yes. to, there are bullies. And so you need a defense. You can't just let bullies be bullies. Or, oh, you know. and wait till you get to the fourth book in this. <laughs> Oh, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. You want some bullies? Oh, baby, I've <laughs> we got, got some bullies. bullies. <laughs> oh. uh, and uh, it ended up being a, a bit of a back and forth. Last Wednesday, the diplomats were given one day to clear out and close the embassy. Two days later, last Friday the 9th, Albania was hit by another major cyber attack, which has officials once again pointing the finger at Iran. The attack hit Albania's Total Information Management System, as it's called, TIMS, which is an IT platform belonging to Albania's Ministry of Interior used to keep track of people entering and leaving the country. According to a series of tweets from Albania's Minister of the Interior, six border crossing points were impacted and experienced border crossing stoppages for at least two days. This included five land crossings uh, at Greece, Kosovo, and several in Montenegro and at the airport near Albania's capital. Ministry officials banned the attack on uh, the same hand, as they put it, that hit Albania's IT network in July, in other words, Iran. So, you know, let's hope that the world is watching and recognizes that, you know, cyber attacks are not going to be treated you know, like uh, anything less than the attack that they really are, especially when they, you know, uh, seriously impact government uh, infrastructure. Okay, so <laughs> I feel that I should note something else that I'm seeing constantly, which I just skip over without, typically without comment on this podcast, and that's crypto heists of this or that also ran cryptocurrency nonstop. they're nonstop they're oh my god constant from from this or that random exchange that no one's ever heard of before right. or random newbies being crypto scammed you know so this week i'll give everyone three perfect typical examples leo of, of what we're both talking about so everyone has a feeling for what they're normally not missing Okay, first, get this. The new free DAO, uh, that's the NFD token. That's a whatever DAO. That, it's a DAO. Right. right. It's the a DAO. Autonomous the, you know, organization, right. yeah. The, the, the new free DAO token lost 99% of its value after a threat actor used a flash loan attack to steal more than $1.5 million worth of crypto from the platform. According to blockchain security firm Certike, the hacker appears to be the same attacker who also hit DeFi platform Knee Order four months ago. <laughs> I know. I gripping laugh. news. I shouldn't laugh. I know. No, but Leo. The sad thing okay. is, I don't mind if some Bitcoin bro loses his shirt. That's fine. But probably a lot of these people are just suckers, normal people. Unfor yes, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, the, also, the operators of the the Jira cryptocurrency suspended operations last week after a hacker gained control over the platform's smart contract, which is the name of it, which apparently wasn't so smart, after developers leaked the private key. According to the Jira team, the attacker minted one and a half million dollars worth of crypto, which they later transferred to their own Ethereum address. The platform has not yet resumed operations. Okay, boo-hoo. And third, Romanian law enforcement raided two penthouses. I got a kick of the fact that they were in penthouses. Two penthouses in Bucharest and detained three suspects. 
According to a joint investigation with the UK's National Crime Agency, the NCA, the suspects would contact victims. Get this, Leo. You're going to love it. The suspects would contact victims of cryptocurrency fraud and defraud them again. <laughs> oh, that's by horrible. posing by posing as financial fraud recovery oh. specialists oh. and ask for a substantial fee to recover their initial losses. <sighs> Once a sucker, you know, you got the sucker hat on, they're going to come at you. <laughs> oh. You're wearing it. So, just so everyone knows, there is now a more or less constant flux of these sorts of heists. I mean, cryptocurrency, no one seems to be able to hold on to it. It's, it's just constant. This is I a great website from Molly White called Web3 is going just great. And she has a, <laughs> she has a little counter in the lower right-hand corner of how much money has been lost to oh. crypto fraud. And it's it is it's kind of stunning. It's just nonstop. What does it show? Ten point ten point six six nine billion dollars. Oh my lord! I mean, this wow. is a classic. This is a typical headline. Algo Rand Foundation discloses thirty five million dollar exposure to Hodel Knot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta you don't want to expose your Hodel Knot, Leo. <laughs> Uh, Hold it. Well, both of these were legit. Hold on, lot oh. was a, a crypto wallet uh, that halted withdrawals on August eighth. Algorand is a uh, is a proof of stake blockchain, and they foolishly put thirty five million dollars into Hodelnot, and then Hodelnot was heavily exposed to Terra, which collapsed in May. <laughs> So Hodel uh, not halted cause withdrawals because there's no regulation. Could possibly, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, yes, no regulation. The children are running the bank. Oh, incredible. Oh, goodness. Incredible. Yes, I, I, you know, if we, if we titled our podcasts after the show the way you do for Mac Break Weekly, it would be Never Exposure Hodel Not. Yeah. And by uh, the way, I, I, I'm laughing only because it's so horrible. Because, and again, if it were Bitcoin bros, fine. You know, throw your ill-gotten gains the away. The, the, the Winklestein brothers. Yeah, are let them lose are. all the all the, <laughs> all the the bits in their coin. But it's not. It's sad to say. It's people who are being suckered by NFTs and crypto. Don't be fooled, kids. Uh, we have we have some guy, a neighbor in our neighborhood, who's all NFT yeah. popped up, and I just yeah. you know, and and uh, some other neighbors who know I'm kind of a computer guy say, should we do anything? But I said, no, stay stay stay, stay away as far from, away as you can, stay away from that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, you know, I mean, apparently, if you're Kevin Rose and you you can have a little, what is it, a zombie? He's got he's got a, uh, he owns some zombies, but then, <laughs> oh. and I love Kevin, but I, I think this is a little sketch he created his own owls uh moon moon birds they call them and has been selling them sold them uh, within the first week 50 million dollars worth of them oh and uh what? so many that he you know it's he and a, a, a bunch of other people called the proof collective but it's really he's he's one of the big names there's three there's people is involved in stuff so because it's big names in this area nft area people bought in to the tune of 50 million dollars all of it's speculation. You will only buy an NFT because you think someday some sucker is going to come along and buy it for twice as much. Then Kevin, realizing he's he made a lot of money here, put out a YouTube video saying, "No, no, we're going to do good things with the money." Then last week, uh, it was announced that uh, Mark Andreessen, Andreessen Horowitz, just put another fifty million into it as an investment. So. I think the only thing that, that was we a did good YouTube video. Yeah, the only thing we he, did wrong, he cannot, Steve. He cannot stop making money. <laughs> no, the only thing we did wrong, Steve, is not issuing an <laughs> NFT early, early on. <laughs> uh, that and throwing away the hard drive. Oh, it's uh, you know, I just I I I, I can only say a hundred times, you know, stop, don't. It's not, you know, this is. Bill Murray's NFT charity auction nets $185,000, which is immediately stolen. Hours after the auction, a hacker gained access to Murray's crypto wallet and snagged the 119 ETH for themselves. 
and on and on and on. those bulbs that were once so popular? No, those tulip bulbs. Uh, tulip bulbs. I thought yeah, that was going to be a good a, investment. That was, was going to be a big deal. <laughs> I got them next to my yeah. beanie by babies in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, the White House held a tech platform accountability listening session last Thursday. Uh, uh, in a nation founded on the principle of a right to free and open public speech and a free and open press, um, you know, neither being under the thumb of the government. The question is what responsibility do our social media platforms have and to what degree, if you know, if any about the content their users publish and which they subsequently host and our search engines find and index. Certainly a good question. Now, I looked through the list and the titles of the 16 attendees who were invited to participate in this listing session last week. If it were possible for bureaucracy to reach a critical mass where its own gravitational attraction would cause it to collapse in upon itself, putting this group into a single room would be inadvisable. Um, boy, I mean, the titles, you just, the, 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 you need a line wrap in order to, to see them. Nevertheless, the listing session occurred and everyone appears to have survived. I suppose that a session titled Tech Platform Accountability would tend toward the negative. But boy, did this group dump on today's social media offerings. The White House started everyone off with a negative tone, and the meeting's participants appeared to have willingly added fuel. Um, the summary of the event is not long, and I think it's worth sharing. So here's the White House's summary. They said, although tech platforms can help keep us connected, create a vibrant marketplace of ideas and open up new opportunities for bringing products and services to market. And okay, so just so everyone knows, that's the end of the good news part of the summary. They continued, they can also divide us and wreak serious real world harms. The rise of tech platforms has introduced new and difficult challenges from the tragic acts of violence linked to toxic online cultures to deteriorating mental health and well-being to basic rights of Americans and communities worldwide suffering from the rise of tech platforms big and small. They said today. The White House convened a listening session with experts and practitioners on the harms that tech platforms cause and the need for greater accountability. In the meeting, experts and practitioners identified concerns in six key areas, competition, privacy, youth mental health, misinformation and disinformation, illegal and abusive conduct, including sexual exploitation, and algorithmic discrimination and lack of transparency. One, and for what it's worth, I mean, I'm, I know we are all sympathetic to, you know, the problem that, that we have. There are certainly problems here. They said one participant explained the effects of anti-competitive conduct by large platforms on small and mid-sized businesses and entrepreneurs, including restrictions that large platforms place on how their products operate and potential innovation. Another participant highlighted that large platforms can use their market power to engage in rent seeking, as the term is, which can influence consumer prices. Several participants raised concerns about the rampant collection of vast troves of personal data by tech platforms. Some experts tied this to problems of misinformation and disinformation on platforms, explaining that social media platforms maximize user engagement for profit by using personal data to display content tailored to keep users' attention, content that is often sensational, extreme, and polarizing. Other participants sounded the alarm about risks for reproductive rights and individual safety associated with companies collecting sensitive personal information from where their users are physically located to their medical histories and choices. Another participant explained why mere self-help technological protections for privacy are insufficient 
and participants highlighted the risks to public safety that can stem from information recommended by platforms that promote radicalization, mobilization, and incitement to violence. Multiple experts explained that technology now plays a central role in access to critical opportunities like job openings, home sales, and credit offers, but that too often, companies' algorithms display these opportunities unequally or discriminatorily target some communities with predatory products. The experts also explained that the lack of transparency means that the algorithms cannot be scrutinized by anyone outside the platforms themselves, creating a barrier to meaningful accountability. One expert explained the risks of social media use for the health and well-being of young people, explaining that while some technology per- that while for some, technology provides benefits of social connection, there are also significant adverse clinical effects of prolonged social media use on many children and teens' mental health, as well as concerns about the amount of data collected from apps used by children and the need for better guardrails to protect children's privacy and prevent addictive use and exposure to detrimental content. Experts also highlighted the magnitude of illegal and abusive conduct hosted or disseminated by platforms, but for which they are currently shielded from being held liable and lack of adequate incentive to reasonably address such as child sexual exploitation, cyber stalking, and the non-consensual distribution of intimate images of adults. Ugh. I know. Ugh. The White House, if, I know, the White House officials exposed the meeting, closed the meeting by thanking the experts and practitioners for sharing their concerns. They explained that the administration will continue to work to address the harms caused by a lack of sufficient accountability for technology platforms. They further stated that they will continue working with Congress and stakeholders to make bipartisan progress on these issues and that President Biden has long called for fundamental legislative reforms to address the issues. So it seems clear that much as with the argument over cryptography uh, and you know privacy, which creates an inherent lack of accountability when it can be used by criminals for criminal ends, that you know there's a tension there which. I find fascinating because it's created by technology. Well, there's obviously another set of tensions here, you know, on that that is being created by the technology and frankly, by the willful conduct of these major tech platforms. So it seems clear that sooner or later, we're going to be subjected to legislation of some form as our various governments attempt to somehow you know, it's going to come down to micromanaging this incredibly slippery terrain, which, at least in the United States, also employs constitutionally protected freedoms. So, you know, I imagine there'll be some time spent in the courts as well. Anyway, I wanted to finish by sharing the six bullet point sort of the takeaways, the 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 targets which were cited as their as the main focuses, the core principles for reform. The first is promote competition in the technology sector. They said the American information technology sector has long been an engine of innovation and growth, and the U.S. has led the world in the development of the Internet economy. Today, however, a small number of dominant Internet platforms use their power to exclude market entrants, to engage in rent-seeking, and to gather intimate personal information that they can use for their own advantage. We need clear rules of the road to ensure small and mid-sized businesses and entrepreneurs can compete on a level playing field, which will promote innovation for American consumers and ensure continued U.S. leadership in global technology. We are encouraged to see bipartisan interest in Congress in passing legislation to address the power of tech platforms through antitrust legislation. Second, provide robust federal protections for Americans' privacy. They said there should be clear limits on the ability to collect, use, transfer, and maintain our personal data, 
including limits on targeted advertising. These limits should put the burden on platforms to minimize how much information they collect rather than burdening Americans with reading fine print. We especially need strong protections for particularly sensitive data, such as geolocation and health information, including information related to reproductive health. We're encouraged, again, to see bipartisan interest in Congress in passing legislation to protect privacy. Third, protect our kids by putting in place even stronger privacy and online protections for them, including prioritizing safety by design standards and practices for online platforms, products, and services. They said children, adolescents, and teens are especially vulnerable to harm. Platforms and other interactive digital service providers should be required to prioritize the safety and well-being of young people above profit and revenue in their product design, including by restricting excessive data collection and targeted advertising to young people. And I, for one, I, I don't have any young kids, never had to raise them in this Internet age, but it would be a terrifying prospect, yeah, I think. The problem, to, see, I, I agree with all of these sort of in principle. The problem is the implementation. I, I, I'm with you completely, Leo. And I and I heard you talking last week. Uh, it wasn't here. It was in the uh, uh, the. Um, the tech dirt guys yeah, uh, dialogue with you twig. yeah yes uh, uh, about some of the the ideas that california's legislators have come up with and, and it's passed, just like by the way it's in it's in right. law and uh it's a terror it should be terrifying to you because yes you have potentially 18 year olds and under using your site you want them to that means you have to design your site and everybody has to design their site for the lowest common denominator um, and that's ridiculous. That's just absurd. Yeah. Uh, that's not how you protect kids. So, yeah. you know, well, let's change the internet and make it safe for kids. You mean all of it? Yeah, all of it. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's very much like the, the overreach of the, uh, grant permission for cookies It's like, Oh yeah. my goodness. You know, yeah. let's fix them rather than, you know, make everyone agree to them. There's some things I completely agree with. You know, we need to work on privacy protections. I agree. But yep. then, then they mix intermix this with this, you know, to protect the children, the design of websites, the, the you know, that, that was all code uh, earlier on about social networks to overturn Section 230 of the DMCA, right. which is vital to the Internet. Um, yes. And it's just a, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of how it works. And it's politics. And it's very shameful. I'm very disappointed, frankly. Yeah. So I'll just skip over. I'll just I'll just summarize oh, the last sorry. three points. There was remove special legal protections for large tech platforms, and here we come to Section Two Hundred and Thirty. Just as you were saying, Leo, is like you know how, how can we make open platforms actually responsible for everything that their that their participants post? I mean, it's I mean again, it it's a problem that they're not. It's a problem what people are posting, but it's impractical to say to, to make them responsible section you know, 230 it, makes it possible for them to moderate the problem yes. is you have some politicians who don't like to be moderated they call uh -huh. it deplatforming and if you keep if you make it impossible to moderate well that's not good get ready <laughs> it's gonna be bad news mm. yep mm. Number five is increased transparency about platforms, algorithms, and content moderation decisions. They said, despite the central role in American life, tech platforms are notoriously opaque. Their decisions about what content to display to a given user and when and how to remove content from their sites affect Americans' lives and American society in profound ways. However, platforms are failing to provide sufficient transparency to allow the public and researchers to understand how and why such decisions are made their potential effects on users and their very real dangers these decisions may so, pose california <laughs> passed a law on this too just the other day uh which mike masnick calls the spammers protection act because it essentially wow. says tell uh any make it public how you block spam how you you know clear stuff out that's bad decide which is not yeah you know, what is not make your algorithms public and oh by the way you can't change them 
unless you pu have a period of publishing it and stuff. So all this does is tell people how to game the system. It achieves nothing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Do your show. No, I, no, you no, get, no, Leo. You get me all like heated up. Hear from you. Heated up. <laughs> I'm all head up now. And finally, number six: stop discriminatory algorithmic decision making. They say we need strong protections to ensure algorithms do not discriminate against protected groups, such as by failing to share key opportunities equally, by discriminatorily exposing vulnerable communities to risky products, or through persistent surveillance. So. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, what was the famous line? We're the government and we're here to help. <laughs> but, you know, honestly, I don't think we should depend on the tech platforms to regulate themselves. No. They won't. I, no. So no. government needs to, but it needs to do so intelligently, not stupidly, and not with a political axe to grind. You know, I mean, capitalism has a lot going for it. One of the problems it has, however, is it it does tend to mon to form monopolies it naturally forms monopolies someone some one or group will get bigger than others and they will use the power of their bigness to continue to accelerate so it's a it's an th that creates positive rather than negative feedback and it's unstable so it's a good system but it needs yep. management yep. Yep. and yep. we've got something like that here yep. happening i agree and so we do need regulation but Boy, yeah. you know, maybe we maybe we need people under the age of fifty to do it. Perhaps that's the problem. They just well, and you know, in the case of the internet, we also have a single global network carrying services which straddles nations whose governments grant their citizenry really widely differing rights and which restrict the behavior of their enterprises in widely differing ways. So, how does I mean I. Uh, presumably, they've been trying to so far. How does a single Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Google simultaneously satisfy the widely differing requirements of, you know, different geographical regions of the globe? You know, I mean, these are hard problems. So, oh, before I leave the subject of governments, Bert Hubert, um, a member of, oh, in fact, you know, we're well into the podcast, Leo. Let's tell our listeners why we're still here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, glad to do it. Before we get to Bert, Bert, hang on. We'll be with you in a moment. But first, it's time to tell the world about our canary. I love this little guy. This little canary is a lifesaver. It's a honeypot. We, we've we talked about honeypots on this show. It's one of the very first things we ever talked about. Uh, that was long before the folks at Thinkst came up with the canary, but not long before they were teaching governments, companies, militaries how to break into networks. They were, they've been doing this for more than a, a decade, and they used the knowledge they had to create the canary. This is the hacker's worst nightmare. It is a device that sits on your network. Maybe it shows up in Active Directory. Uh, it's, it's completely benign looking. It doesn't look vulnerable. It looks valuable and it could be a, a server windows or Linux. It could be a switch. It could be a router, a SCADA device, identical down to the Mac address. This one's set up as my Synology NAS. That's not a Synology NAS, but it looks like it. And when you try to log in, what happens? I get an alert saying there's somebody snooping around on your network. And that's what these are so valuable for. You protect the perimeter, I'm sure. We do. Everybody should. But what happens when bad guys get in? And we know they get in. Worse, we know, on average, it takes 191 days before the company realizes they've been breached. Six months for a bad guy to wander around unimpeded, to, to download files, to look at where your backups are and place time bombs there. If their goal is to put out ransomware, man, they're going to scope the whole system. Do know everything that's going on so that ransomware is doubly effective. And oh, the new thing, by the way, before you set off the time bomb, let's exfiltrate a lot of information so we can blackmail you later. This is your worst nightmare unless you've got this, the Thinkst Canary. In fact, the other thing that's great about this, this will set tripwires throughout your network. 
You won't just have one of these. You'll have them spread out all over your network, looking like a lot of different devices. But they can also create something called Canary Tokens, which look just like documents. They sit on your hard drive, like a Windows Excel spreadsheet or, um, you know, maybe a PDF or a database. But they're not. They're tokens. And as soon as a bad guy attempts to open them, it triggers an alert. Now, this is great because you're not going to get any false alarms. You're only going to get alerts that really matter, that really say, "There's you got a problem. And you can get it in any way you want. Email, text message, or all of the above, by the way. When you get a canary, you'll get a console. Of course, it's going to be on there. You can have them send you a Slack message. It supports web hooks. That means it's open to a whole bunch of different ways you could do it. Syslog. A lot of guys I know, like sysops, use syslog. That's a great way to do it. They even have an API if you want to code up something on your own. Canaries. These are fantastic. Uh, let me give you some idea of the pricing. So most, you know, small companies might have a half a dozen. A uh, big bank might have hundreds spread out all over. You know, you want them in all the nooks and crannies so that when somebody gets in, the first thing they stumble on is this canary so that you know immediately, right? Uh, let's say you want five of them. That's a good number to start with. That's 7500 bucks a year. You get five canaries. You get your own hosted console. You get all the upgrades, the support, the maintenance for that year. If you sit on your canary, they immediately send you a new one. Don't worry. Actually, I could sit on this all day. It wouldn't break, but <laughs> just, you know, if you if you did. Uh, you'll, you, <laughs> uh, I'm going to give you a deal. I'll tell you what. If you use the code TWIT in the How Did You Hear Bus back, so you tell things, hey, we saw this on uh, Security Now. Just use TWIT. Uh, it's easy to remember. Four letters. Uh, you will get 10% off your canary, and not just for the year, but for your life forever. Okay. And we know you're going to love this thing, but even but if for some reason it doesn't suit, you got 60 days to return it for a full refund. Two months money back guarantee. So there is zero risk. But don't be, you know, don't put this on your network and then say, well, I don't hear anything. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. If the little green light's on and you're not hearing anything, that's a good thing, but you'll be really glad when you get that message saying, hey, you know, somebody just tried to open me. <sighs> then you know you got problems. Canary.tools slash twit. This is the canary in your data mine. Enter the code twit in the how did you hear about us box. You get 10%. We get credit. We thank Canary uh, for all they do. Canary.tools slash twit. There's another little twist on that, by the way. Yeah. Uh, in my research this week for the podcast, I ran across a new product that they're offering. Uh, what you just described is great for detecting infiltration from the outside, but we know that insider threats are a problem also. Absolutely. They have the ability to plant monitors on the workstations throughout an enterprise, and then the IT can assign what they call protected commands. And if any command is issued on a workstation, which is under canary monitoring, it will send the same sort of message to headquarters saying, uh, somebody over here has just done something that uh, you told us you wanted to be informed oh, of. Oh, that's really cool. So it's watching more than just the activity against the canary. It's watching c commands yeah. that people are issuing and stuff. That's great. That, yeah. yeah, these these guys at Thinkster are pretty sharp, pretty canny individuals. We talk to them once in a while. I, I really like them. Really a great bunch. Okay, so uh, back to Bert. Uh, Bert Hubert, and you know, Mr. and Mrs. Hubert... <laughs> Why? Why, Bert? I, I don't really. <laughs> Why, you Bert? Really, did, did you really have to name your <laughs> your son Bert? You think his uh, real name is Hubert Hubert? Yo. Humbert uh, Humbert? <laughs> uh, anyway, he's a member, or actually he was, of TIB, the Dutch government board that checks the legality and approves communications interception warrants for the Dutch intelligence and security services well, as I said, he was because he resigned last week. Um, the automatic English translation of Bert's blog posting explaining his decision was so atrocious, he said, that he wrote an English version himself. Uh, and I'm glad he did because if I were serving in a government that I believed in, I'd hire this guy in a second based on what he wrote. So here's what he said. He said, if either 
of the civil or the military intelligence and security services of the Netherlands want to use a lawful intercept, SIGINT, or hacking, or some other legal powers, they must first convince their own jurists, then their ministry, and finally the TIB. The TIB then studies if the warrant is legal and that decision is binding. He said, when I joined the regulatory commission, I was very happy to find that the Dutch intelligence and security services were doing precisely the kinds of things you'd expect such services to do. I also found that our regulatory mechanisms worked as intended. If anything was found to be amiss, the services would actually stop doing that. If the ex-ante regulator, meaning up front in advance, he says, i.e. my board, ruled a permission to do something was unlawful, it would indeed not happen. He says, I think it is important to affirm this in public. Over the past two years, however, there have been several attempts to change or amend the Dutch intelligence law. The most recent attempt has now cleared several legislative hurdles and looks set to be passed by Parliament. He said, under this new law, my specific role, technical risk analysis, would mostly be eliminated. In addition, the Dutch SIGINT, bulk interception powers, would be stripped of a lot of regulatory requirements. Furthermore, there are new powers, like using algorithmic analysis on bulk intercepted data without a requirement to get external approval. Finally, significant parts of the oversight would move from upfront, ex ante, to ongoing or afterwards, ex post. Doing upfront authorization of powers, he says, is relatively efficient and is also pleasingly self regulating. If an agency overloads or confuses its ex ante regulator, they simply won't get permission to do things. This provides a strong incentive for clear and concise requests to the regulator. A regulator that has to investigate ongoing affairs, however, is in a difficult position. It can easily become overloaded, especially if it's unable to recruit sufficient technical experts. In the current labor market, it is unlikely that a regulator will be able to swiftly recruit sufficient numbers of highly skilled computer experts able to do ongoing investigations of sophisticated hacking campaigns and bulk interception projects. An overloaded regulator does not provide good coverage. It is also vulnerable to starve the beast tactics. He said once it became clear the intended law would likely pass Parliament, I knew I would have to resign anyhow. Wow. Since I don't agree, uh-huh, since I don't agree with the new expanded powers and the changes in oversight. As a member of the regulatory board, I could not share my worries about the new law. The regulatory board itself is staffed with excellent people, but by design, the board only operates within the existing law. It is not responsible for formulating or even criticizing any new laws. Instead of waiting out the likely passing of the new law, I've decided to leave now. This enables me to speak my mind on what is wrong with the new law. It may not help, but at least it's better than watching democratic backtracking in silence. It has been a great honor to have been part of the Regulatory Powers Board. Its staff and members are an impressive bunch and I wish them the best of luck with their ongoing and important work. On a final note, if anyone is looking for a government regulator with a proven track record of resigning when things go wrong, know that I'm available. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> You're hired. Wow. Good for Bert Bert or whatever his name is. That's great. That's great. Yeah.
Wow. And it's also worth noting, although Bert didn't mention that in his blog posting, that his TIB flagged several cases of abuse last year that targeted journalists and several cases of broad warrants that intercept bulk traffic over entire global Internet cables. So wow. his term for what he, what he sees happening, I, I thought, was great. He called it democratic backtracking. And I thought this was worth sharing since it shows the way democracy will decay if it's not fully understood and continually reinforced. You know, it as I said before, it's not an inherently stable system since it is subject to creeping manipulation. You know, just think of the U.S. tax code. <laughs> if you need another example of, of creeping manipulation. Mm, oh, yeah. You know, some group of right-minded people originally established the operation of the Dutch Regulatory Commission to work the way it does today for a reason. For, you know, at least some of the reasons Bert has explained. But, you know, who knows? Maybe those who did this are now out of power. Um, and those being regulated have been chafing at the limitations the current system deliberately imposes upon them. You know? Yes, it's an inconvenient and annoying. It's meant to be. You know, surveillance of a free and democratic people should not be the default. It should be the exception. And it does seem that initiating the surveillance first and asking for permission, either concurrently or afterward, is far more likely to lead to abuse. Again, the question is, what principles do we want to support? So... Bravo, Bert. Um, you know, Bravo, I'm sorry Bert. you ha I'm sorry you needed to resign, but you know, that's what people have to do if yeah. you know they see things happening around them that they cannot participate in in good conscience. Awesome. And it's I'm glad you gave him a forum. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Another near constant event that, that I choose to only cover periodically, actually you and I talked about it after we began, we stopped recording last week, Leo, is horrendous problems occurring in QNAP NAS software. You know, it's just, just constant. Um, since it's entirely possible to run a non-QNAP OS on their QNAP hardware, I dearly hope that anyone listening to this podcast will have switched out QNAP's constantly disappointing firmware for any of the Linux or Unix alternatives that are that are known to run on the hardware. In fact, QNAP's own platform is a Linux derivative. So you can do that. And if you do, and, you know, again, Google will show you how. Um, and if you do need to remain with QNAP, please, by all means, Protect it from the public Internet. We've talked about many ways to do that uh, in the past. Even Q now, QNAP themselves has told their own users not to expose their devices to the Internet, despite the fact that they're well, networked that's storage. the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know. Okay. I know. Okay, so Deadbolt is both a ransomware and a ransomware group that has been plaguing QNAP users and their devices throughout 2022, all year. Since January, thousands of QNAP customers have reported being attacked by the Deadbolt Ransomware Group. The group demands a ransom of 0.03 Bitcoin, currently around $1,100 for the decryption key. After the initial attacks affected about 3,600 devices last January, the group continued to resurface with campaigns in March, May, and June of this year. They're a persistent bunch. Reddit and other message boards have been flooded with customers lamenting the loss of files that included family photo albums, wedding videos, and more. You know, irreplaceable things. Dozens of users took to Reddit to complain that they were among those attacked in the latest campaign. In a note to QNAP, the hackers demanded five Bitcoin, which would be about uh, just shy of $94,000, to reveal details about the alleged zero-day vulnerabilities they initially used to attack its users 
and another woo, 50 Bitcoin, which is just shy of a million dollars, to release a master decryption key that would unlock all of the their, their victims, their users' victim files. Now, QNAP would not say whether it was it has considered paying the ransom for the universal decryption key, which is to say, uh, no. Um, but we can be pretty sure um, that that's not going to happen also when a spokesman said the company's research, so this is the QNAP spokesman, said the company's research has shown that the Deadbolt group is attacking legacy versions with known vulnerabilities which have security updates available. Okay, sounds logical, reasonable, maybe true. In other words, they're saying it's not it's the user's fault, not theirs. So, they should pay if they want their data back. Now, some users have disputed QNAP's insistence that only devices that have not been updated are being attacked. And this kind of seems reasonable since since the, the group behind this, the Deadbolt group, are coming up with new ways to do this all the time. And here's a little bit of a gotcha. If ransom is paid, the key provided by Deadbolt may not work. So the, the security company we've talked of several times, MSISoft, released its own version of a Deadbolt decryptor after several victims reported having issues with the one they received in exchange for paying a ransom. However, it's not any sort of universal decryptor. It only works with a decryption key supplied by the operators of the Deadbolt ransomware through a ransom payment. MSISoft's Fabian Wosar tweeted, QNAP users who got hit by Deadbolt and paid the ransom are now struggling to decrypt their data because a forced firmware update issued by QNAP removed the payload that is required for decryption. <laughs> okay, so this got so bad, finally, that QNAP took matters into their own hands and forced a firmware update onto their customers, which broke the ability for the ransomware payment to, after receiving the decryption key to function. So, wow, MSISoft came along and said, okay, we'll fix that for you, and they did. What a mess. Earlier this year, the security company Census, who runs that IoT search engine, remember, you know, we, we've often talked about Shodan. There's now another kid in town, Census, and they're doing neat things. Anyway, they, they, they have a, a, ser a search engine that goes wide and deep for IoT stuff. They reported, and, and a, QNAP, a, a, a QNAP NAS is considered an IoT device, they reported that of the total 130,000 QNAP NAS devices sold 4,988. So just shy of 5,000 um, of those servers exhibited the telltale signs of this specific piece of ransomware. So about 5,000 compromises. Census also managed to track the Bitcoin wallet transactions associated with an infection and found that of the previous batch of victims, 132 paid ransoms, totaling about $188,000. So, you know, this is making money for someone who is saying, we'll give you all of the stuff you've lost on your NAS for, uh, for $1,000 in Bitcoin. 132 people in that particular batch did so. Uh, the uh, the uh, census also created a dashboard to track the number of victims around the world. The majority of the most recent infections are taking place in the U.S., Germany, and the U.K. And it's not over. Since all of that, uh, and this is really what finally uh, caused this to rise above my QNAP threshold, uh, census observed that the number of QNAP NAS devices infected by the same deadbolt ransomware spiked from 2,144, on, which was the count on July 9th, to, to 19,029 
on September 4th, which was Sunday before last. The spike arose uh, because the ever-industrious deadbolt gang exploited, yes, another new zero-day vulnerability in the photo app or the photo station app, which is installed on most QNAP NAS systems. So they're finding more new ways in. And okay, again, if you have a QNAP NAS with QNAP software, get it off the Internet. And if you can, put in a replacement software set. Just And, and it is possible. Uh, there are third-party uh, solutions for QNAP. Oh, and before we leave the census internet scanning company, it's worth noting that they're, they, they recently published a 2022 state of the internet report, which observed that misconfigurations accounted for 60% of the issues they observed across all internet exposed services oh globally. God. That's a good number. Yeah. Wow. Y yeah. They tr they found that software, the software there was the the software problems only accounted for twelve percent of all observed problems. That is software vulnerabilities. It wasn't it, it it so all of these problems are misconfigurations. Now, it's unclear whether placing a QNAP NAS onto the internet would inherently be considered a misconfiguration of those devices, but it, it seems pretty clear that it should be. You do, do not want to put one of those things on the net. Also, one last IoT note, D-Link is currently being taken over by Moobot, uh, M-O-O-B-O-T. Palo Alto Networks Unit 42 has identified a three-year-old Mirai botnet variant known as Moobot. It's uh, rapidly finding and co-opting any remaining vulnerable D-Link routers into another army of denial-of-service bots by taking advantage of multiple old and two new, uh, but all patched exploits. Last Tuesday, Unit 42 said, if the devices are compromised, they will be fully controlled by attackers who could utilize those devices to further conduct attacks such as distributed uh, denial of service. Okay, so Mubot, uh, which was first identified and disclosed by the Chinese group, the uh, Kihu 360's NetLab team in, back in September of 2019, so three years ago, Mubot has previously targeted uh, Lilin, L-I-L-I-N, digital video recorders, and those Hikvision video surveillance products we were talking about a couple weeks ago. In the latest wave of attacks discovered by Unit 42 early last month, as many as four different highly critical flaws in D-Link devices are being used in the development of MUBOT samples. So the four flaws, the, one, the oldest, believe it or not, CVE 2015... 2051 carries a CVSS, you know, gotta love this one, of 10.0. I mean, it, it must just be that you, you connect to the D Link router and says, please, sir, may I enter? And it says, oh, by all means, make yourself at mm, home. Mm. How, how do you get a 10.0? I don't know. On a, wow. Uh, on a, so that one is an H, it's called the HNAP SOAP Action Header command execution vulnerability. You probably just put a command in the header and it runs it for you. Uh, a CVE 2018, 6330, so back from year 2018, that's got a CVSS of 9.8, still right up there with the best of them. Uh, this one is the D-Link SOAP uh, interface remote code execution vulnerability. Sounds kind of generic, but okay. Then the other two are 2022, this year CVEs, both also carrying scores of 9.8. D-Link D goes big. Uh, they are both also remote command execution vulnerabilities. So, as I said, successful exploitation of any one of those four flaws, which all have very low attack complexities, 
so we're told, is used to remotely launch a wget command, which retrieves the mubot payload from a remote host. Mubot then, after it started, parses instructions from a command and control server to launch DDoS attacks in ways we're all too familiar with. So although the oldest vulnerability is from 2015 and the next oldest is from 2018, those other two, which are, you know, 9.8 remote code execution vulnerabilities known and patched were only fixed this year. So anyone who knows anyone who uses a D-Link router should be certain that they have updated recently because these deadbolt guys are on the prowl and they're looking for all the routers they can get in them that they can get themselves into. <clears throat> okay. Leo. Would you like me to do something? No. No. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> but thank you. Shortly. I'm, just, I'm here shortly, when you need yes. me, man. I'm just shortly, I'm just here for yes. you. Last week. Oh, I want to hear about this. Our, yes. I introduced our listeners to my latest science fiction reading discovery, Scott Yuha's The Silver Ships, thanks to one of our listeners. I have been having so much fun oh, now you ever got since. Now I got to have it. <laughs> Leo, I'm now halfway through the fourth book. Actually, I'm at 71%. And I can assert that this is the most engaging and satisfying series of novels I have read in a long, long time. Wow. Uh, and just wait until you meet the Sui Sui. For those of you who prefer to have books read to them, I'm so glad, Leo, that you said that the reader of this series is someone you know and you enjoy listening yeah, to. Yeah, he's good, yeah. Beca because I wouldn't want anything to spoil the experience of Audible's listeners. My initial mild concern after only the first book uh, was that uh, Scott Yuha's character development might be overly focused upon his story's central character, a young asteroid miner by the name of Alex Racine. Well, that concern has dissolved completely. We now have a broadcast of wonderful characters, and this guy writes so well. I was trying to put into context for myself how good this book series is. I mean, I was I'm just giddy reading it. Um, I know that there have been times in the past when I have been this thrilled over a science fiction storyline. Um, the Honor Harrington novels, Michael McCullum's Gibraltar Stars trilogy. And I'm sure that some of Peter Hamilton's stories did this, although there, there was always a lot to wade through. Uh, w with his major work, uh, and there must be others, since it, it is a familiar feeling for me to be so satisfied when I'm reading the inventions of a skilled storyteller who really knows how to weave a yarn and who has come up with a bunch of great new sci-fi technologies and people, both human and non. Another thing I've noticed is that, like the best serialized stories, a lot happens in every installment. So far, there's been no sense of Scott stringing us along. Um, even when the action slows down for a while, as almost has to happen from time to time, there turns out to be a real purpose in the way we were spending that time. And you know, the best books always are always cause those of us who love to read to immediately wish for amnesia so that the story can be experienced again new. Um, anyway, this series is the equal of any I've read. And, oh boy, prepare yourself for a huge surprise at the start of book three. Oh boy. So, <laughs> anyway, it is just, it is so good. I can't start it till September 22nd. I, I understand. I need my I know audible you've got credits. a backlog. <laughs> I know you have a backlog. Oh, speaking of which, funny you should mention that. Yes. Uh, the tweet from X4JW, he said, Hi, Steve. Thanks for the recommendation of the Silver Ships series of books. Went to purchase book one on my Audible account oh. and was surprised slash delighted to see that books 
two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine are all included for free as part of the Audible Plus membership. Oh. And I just had Ooh. to click add to library to grab those. He said, I can understand why book one is not free. Not sure why book six isn't. So again, it's you gotta buy book one, then two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine are all free. Nice. And then he said books ten to twenty or also purchase to own titles on Audible. He said, anyway, just thought readers, he has in quotes, using Audible might like to know that they can get 35% of the series yeah. for free <laughs> as part of the Plus subscription service. Then by the time you're hooked at book 11, <laughs> oh, you go buy I, the rest uh, of them. <laughs> Leo, as I said, I, I'm at 71% of in book four. I, I'm astonished by what this guy has done. Oh uh, it, it is, uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, we were talking about bullies and, you know, mm, in, oh, in book four, he's, there's some people you just want to ha have get what's coming to them. And, <laughs> oh, do they ever. <laughs> oh, I might, I might have to buy this one just ahead of time, just to get started. I love it that oh. I get so many of them for free. That's good. Uh, yeah, that you know. So the guy who reads at Grover Gardner, I've spent some time with because he read Stephen King's The Stand. So I've spent at least forty-eight hours with <laughs> listening to Grover Gardner. Actually, read uh, listened to several of uh, his audio books. Uh, he's got you know. You might at first say, "Well, I don't like his voice." Just bear with him. He, uh, I think, for something like this, he's a good choice because he's a very clear, simple, easy to understand reader, and it sounds like there's a lot of content here. So. This will be good. Yeah, I, I really, I really like Grover Gardner. So, okay, Fun. let's take our break, Thank you. and then we're going to talk about the evil proxy service. I appreciate your recommendations, Steve. So far, uh, I get a lot of feedback from our listeners saying, you know, they've liked everything I've. Suggested. Oh, it's it's always so. great to get them, you know. And we have Stacy's Book Club, which is a sci-fi book club. I get some, yep. you know. Between this show and This Week in Google, I, <laughs> that's why my list is so long on Audible and I'm so far behind. I get so many good recommendations, but I, I think I might start this sooner than oh. later. It's, you're really oh, selling me. It, yeah. Oh, yeah. Speaking of selling you, I want to sell you on New Relic. I think New Relic is great. What makes a great developer? Curiosity, right? The first to explore new tech. You read the documentation. You want to know how things work and why they work that way. You've got that kind of mind, right? But that's exactly why so many engineers turn to New Relic. New Relic gives you data about what you build as a developer and shows what's really happening in your software lifecycle. And this is so valuable. You know, you write your code, you, you commit it, you launch it. It has a life of its own. And, and if things go wrong, it's kind of a, it's out there. It's a mystery, not with New Relic. It's a single place to see the data from your entire stack. 16 tools in one. You don't have to go out and get 16 independent tools and try to make them somehow work with one another. No, they all integrate into a single pane of glass. It pinpoints issues down to the line of code. This is like debugging on steroids, right? Imagine if you could not just see, you know, your software stack, but the, the whole operating stack, the cloud, everything, and then see where the problem is. You can resolve it quickly. That's why developers and ops teams at DoorDash and Epic Games use New Relic. GitHub uses New Relic. In fact, 14,000 companies use New Relic to debug and improve their software. When teams come together around data, it allows you to triage problems, be confident in decisions, and reduce the time needed to implement resolutions using data, not opinions. Use the data platform made for the curious. Right now, you can get access to the whole New Relic platform and 100 gigabytes of data per month, free, forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash security now. N-E-W-R-E-L-I-C dot com slash security now. Thank you, New Relic, for saving the lives of thousands of developers all over the world and for supporting security now. We really appreciate it. NewRelic.com slash security now. One word. Thank you, New Relic. All right, Steve. On with the show, and let's talk about these evil proxies. Oh, boy. So, um, wow. As you said, and you, were, you, you hit it exactly right, Leo, in retrospect, it was obvious that this was going to happen. Last Monday, 
the security research group called ReSecurity published their findings about a recently appearing, just last May, new, fully functional, turnkey, phishing-as-a-service system known as Evil Proxy. Key among the many powerful features of this new underground service debuting on the dark web is its effortless ability to intercept SMS, OAuth, and one-time token, multi-factor, you know, time-based token, multi-factor authentication flows. As a result, the login with some other website like Google or Facebook or enter the SMS code we just sent to your phone or enter the six-digit code displayed on your authenticator are all effortlessly, effortlessly bypassed and rendered ineffective. Okay, this is all accomplished by streaming the actual target website where the naive user believes they are logging in through a transparent reverse proxy, which I'll explain further in a minute. They're not actually where they think they are. And unless they are scrupulously attentive to the URL being displayed in their browser's URL bar, they will be unwittingly providing their full authentication credentials, including any form of multi-factor authentication, to a malicious third party who will intercept their successful login session token to obtain a full secondary login to their account with all the rights that arise from that. Okay, so this sort of proxying is one of the inherent Achilles heels of the way the web works. Um, well, I remember clearly one summer when I was deep into the work on Squirrel, I brought my work to a halt in order to completely wrap my head around this whole problem of spoofing because it's a tough one. I felt as though I still didn't have an absolutely crystal clear understanding of exactly where the problem arose, and I needed Squirrel to solve it if it was possible. Anyway, I figured it out, and the result for Squirrel was something called CPS, Client Provided Session, and it does indeed, once and for all, completely solve this problem. Now, since I'm at work on Spinright 6.1, I haven't taken the time to determine whether the FIDO2 and the WebAuthn folks also solve this problem. Uh, and, you know, I, I guess it doesn't matter whether it does solve it or not, since the passkey system is what we'll eventually be getting. In fact, it's, it's live in iOS 16, which is now on iOS devices that are able to take it. But for what it's worth... It is possible to completely solve the problem. Um, and, you know, that's another one of the things that Squirrel does. Anyway, remember the wonderful observation, which uh, we credit to Bruce Schneier. I mentioned it at the top of the show. You know, he said something to the effect of attacks never get weaker. They only ever get stronger. Uh, we're about to see an example of Bruce's observation, uh, you know, on steroids. Um, the thing that is so chilling about this new evil proxy service is exactly that. It's a service. The, that horrifying, we thought, log4j Java vulnerability, which began the year, you know, it's certainly a problem. But as we previously described, it turned out not to be the end of the world for one reason. It was not a slam dunk, drop and go, easy to use vulnerability. Every specific instance of its use needed to be deliberately engineered for the specific target where that potential vulnerability might be exploited. And the industry learned an important lesson from that. It matters far less whether something is possible than whether it's easy. Which brings me to why this new evil proxy phishing as a service facility is so horrifying. The service providers have created an astonishingly powerful, simple to use point and click web interface for their service. Through this interface, 
powerful fishing campaigns can be created by filling out some fields, selecting the required features, and pressing a Create Campaign button. If the Log4j vulnerability uh, never exploded because it was difficult to use, this evil proxy service promises to be an instant hit because it could hardly be any easier to use. So that everyone can see for themselves, this week's GRC shortcut of the week, so that's grc.sc slash 888, will bounce its user's browser to a four-minute Vimeo video. That's Vimeo's number uh, four, uh, sorry, 746-020-364. But you can just put in grc.sc slash 888. That will show you uh, a video which the evil proxy service provider uses to market and demo the ease of the ease of use of their tool. Okay, so now let's back up a bit for a bit of a broader overview of Resecurity's discovery from their coverage of this. The title of their report was Evil Proxy Phishing as a Service with MFA Bypass Emerged in Dark Web. They said, following the recent Twilio hack leading to the leakage of two-factor authentication, one-time password codes, cyber criminals continue to upgrade their attack arsenal to orchestrate advanced phishing campaigns targeting users worldwide. ReSecurity has recently identified a new phishing as a service, and then they have P-H-A-A-S, in fact, in the same way that ransomware as a service, fast. R-A-A-S, <laughs> yes, so fast, fast. Uh, called Evil Proxy, advertised in the dark web. On some sources, the alternative name is Moloch, or Moloch, sorry, M-O-L-O-C-H. Yeah, evil, Moloch. Moloch, which has, um, uh, you want some Moloch? Which has some connection to a phishing kit developed by several notable underground actors who targeted the financial institutions and e-commerce sector previously. While the incident with Twilio is solely related to the supply chain, cybersecurity risks obviously lead to attacks against downstream targets. The productized underground service like Evil Proxy enables threat actors to attack users with, with enabled multi-factor authentication on the largest scale without the need to hack upstream services. They said evil proxy actors are using reverse proxy and cookie injection methods to bypass multi-factor authentication, proxifying victims' session. Previously, such methods have been seen in targeted campaigns of advanced persistent threat and cyber espionage groups. However, now these methods have been successfully productized in evil proxy, which highlights the significance of growth in attacks against online services and multi-factor authorization mechanisms. Based on the ongoing investigation surrounding the result of attacks against multiple employees from Fortune 500 companies, ReSecurity was able to obtain successful knowledge about evil proxy including its structure, modules, functions, and the network infrastructure used to conduct malicious activity. Early occurrences of evil proxy have been initially identified in connection to attacks against Google and Microsoft customers who have enabled multi-factor authentication on their accounts, either with SMS or application tokens, in other words, you know, authenticators. They said the first mention of Evil Proxy was detected early May 2022. This is when the actors running it released a demonstration video detailing how it could be used to deliver advanced phishing links 
with the intention to compromise consumer accounts belonging to major brands such as Apple, Facebook, GoDaddy, GitHub, Google, Dropbox, Instagram, Microsoft, Twitter, Yahoo, Yandex, and others. Was it on Was it on YouTube so we could all enjoy it? Jeez <laughs> Louise. I know. And Leo, if you scroll down in the notes, look at some of the, the screenshots I've attached. I'll get to them in a second. Okay. Then they finished, notably, Evil Proxy also supports phishing attacks against Python package index, oh, which we were just talking yeah. about, PyPy. Okay, so in their report, these guys embed a screenshot from the Evil Proxy control panel showing the entry and options for proxying PyPy login and authentication. It shows that login, password, and session cookies are, ca are supported, meaning that they're captured. And the user can choose to have the service running for 10 days for $150, 20 days for $250, or 31 days for $400. So your typical quantity discount schedule. God. Up at the top of the page, we see a .onion URL. So this is all being hosted by a hidden Tor Project Onion service. And below is the control panel page selector showing a shopping cart icon labeled available services and prices next to a circled dollar sign icon labeled account balance. Conveniently on the left is an expandable drop down label labeled campaign URLs. And underneath that is create campaign. The reservice guys addressed the point of targeting software repositories. They said, the official software repository for the Python language, Python Package Index, PyPy, um, said last week that project contributors were subject to a phishing attack that attempted to trick them into divulging their account login credentials. The attack leveraged Juice, Juice Stealer as the final payload after the initial compromise. And according to ReSecurity's Hunter team findings related to evil proxy actors who added this function not long before the attack was conducted, suggesting strongly that evil proxy was the reason that the, that the PyPy uh, system was attacked in a phishing attack. Besides PyPy, the functionality of Evil Proxy also supports GitHub and NPMJS, of course, the JavaScript package manager, which is widely used by over 11 million developers worldwide, which enables supply chain attacks via advanced phishing campaigns. It's highly likely the actors aim to target software developers and IT engineers to gain access to their repositories and again, remember, this is this is not the evil proxy people doing the attack. Evil proxy is merely now a service in the same way that ransomware attacks were being conducted by affiliates using the ransomware as a service service. So what we have is we have random cyber criminals now starting to leverage the evil proxy service to launch phishing, sophisticated phishing attacks using that service. So we're already seeing evidence of the evil proxy service in use. Okay, so how does all this work? As I mentioned before, the Internet and the World Wide Web specifically have an inherent problem which is created by the web's brilliantly flexible and powerful underlying technologies. The URL itself, the URL as a thing, was originally intended to be fully human readable, even human typable. But as we've seen, and you know, we've all watched the evolution of web hosted services through the past few decades, We've, we've watched the readability and certainly the typeability of URLs virtually disappear. As I'm typing this text into Google Docs, I look up 
and I see a URL that appears to be mostly random character gobbledygook. And significantly, I opened and have been editing this document at this point for the past three hours. Yet that was the first time my eyes fell upon this page's URL. Why did I have any reason to believe I was at the right place? I was sure I was, because the page looked the way I expected it to look. I never had any doubt. So I never sought or received any further confirmation beyond the composition of the page I'm visiting. I'm one of the hundreds of thousands of people listening to this podcast. I'm, I'm one of us. How do we imagine that a normal Internet user regards all of the utterly indecipherable things that their web browser does? And we've added all of this script-driven automation to the user's experience, too. When a user clicks on a link in a search engine, on a social media site, or in email, they may have noticed their URL bar flickering rapidly as their browser dances among all of today's various third-party link tracking services. Everyone wants to get in there for a piece of the action. So we've fully eliminated any sense from even an unusually savvy user that they should worry about the details of what's going on there. That's just the way things are today. Evil proxy leverages the reverse proxy principle, which is made possible by all of this inherent flexibility we've built into the web. Conceptually, the way it works is simple. The bad guys lead their intended victim to a phishing page. We've talked about phishing extensively in the past, right? You know, it's popal.com. That page uses what's, what's known as a reverse proxy to fetch and display from the legitimate page all of the legitimate content the user expects to see, including login pages. And it sniffs their traffic as it passes through the proxy. It's a classic man in the middle. This in the middle position allows the middleman to harvest the valid web browser session cookies, which are eventually passed back to the victim user, thus using the victim as an authentication mule to provide the usernames, passwords, and even two-factor authentication tokens. Remember also that while the man in the middle is able to intercept and forward one-time tokens for their one-time use, the intercept, they also intercept and obtain the resulting session authentication cookies because the reverse proxy terminates TLS encryption in each direction. It sees everything in the clear. This means that, that anyone not using some form of additional one-time multi-factor authentication will have their username and password stolen in the clear for future use. The Resecurity Guys obtained videos released by the evil proxy service providers demonstrating the use of their point-and-click setup to steal the victim's session and successfully authenticate through Microsoft two-factor authentication and Google's email services to gain access to the target account. The more you see, the more chilling it all is. I've included a link to ReSecurity's full report, which embeds additional Vimeo videos for anyone who wants to become even more frightened. As I noted above, Evil Proxy's services are offered on a prepaid account basis. When the end user cyber criminal chooses a service of interest to target, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, the activation will be for a specific period of time. As I said, 20 or 10, 20 or 31 days it's described in the plan's itemized description. And Leo, there's another screenshot further down with, yep, there it is. Uh, one of the key actors using the moniker John Malkovich acts as gatekeeper administrator to vet all new customers. The service is represented on all major underground communities including XSX, XSX, 
<laughs> XSS and Exploit, both of which we've talked about before, and Breached. Payments for Evil Proxy are arranged manually via an operator on Telegram. Once the funds for the, for the subscription are received, they're deposited into the account in the customer portal hosted in Tor. Use of the service is available for $400 per month in the dark web hosted in the Tor network. And uh, in the show notes and on the screen in the video, we see uh, the options for creating campaigns where Dropbox is used as the phishing target, uh, Ruby Gems, uh, Yandex, Yahoo, Microsoft, and the list. That looks like the list is about well, maybe half of the scroll length based on the, the scroll thumb that we see over on the right. So, and those serve, and more services are being added continually. And in fact, for the Microsoft box, we see xbox.com, skype.com, onenote.com, office.com, microsoftonline.com, microsoft.com, uh, live.com, and bing.com. So you get to choose your target of the phishing attack. The Evil Proxy Portal contains tutorials and interactive videos explaining and demonstrating the use of the service and configuration tips. So the bad guys have done a state-of-the-art job in terms of the service usability and configurability of new campaigns, traffic flows, and data collection. After activation, the operator will be asked to provide SSH credentials to further deploy a Docker container and a set of scripts. This approach was, was likely borrowed from a previous phishing as a service called Frappo, which the re-security guys identified earlier this year. So, what does all this mean? While access to the evil proxy service requires individual cl customer client vetting, cyber criminals now have a cost-effective and scalable point-and-click solution which provides them with all the back-end machinery required to enable them to run advanced phishing attack campaigns on their own while having no skill whatsoever about how to actually do the technology. That's all now turnkey provided for them, just as ransomware as a service was. And that includes bypassing state-of-the-art multi-factor authentication, which is no protection against any of these. The appearance of such a service on the dark web will undoubtedly lead to a significant increase in account takeover, business email compromise activity, and cyber attacks targeting the identity of end users, where multi-factor authentication may now be easily bypassed with the help of tools like this one. And Evil Proxy has no corner on the market. All they really did was to fully automate an already existing aspect of advanced cybercrime. They have made it trivial to do. They clearly got the idea from the preceding ransomware as a service control panels, which act just the same. And as we know, those have been way too successful for exactly the same reason that Evil Proxy promises to be. And we know what will happen next. Other Cretans will see it and decide to compete with it. Once multiple such services exist, competition will drive continued evolution in the features and will also drive down the cost to use them. We built a very powerful and capable World Wide Web whose features are increasingly being used against us. The creation of reverse proxy exploitation followed by an easy to use turnkey service, well, it was probably inevitable, but it's certainly not good news. Wow. Fass. Yes, fast. Fass. Fishing as a service. Mm. And so now the script kitties. Who, Anybody can do are, it. Yeah. Yep. Anybody can do it. And this is the problem I have with things like the Wi-Fi pineapple, too. It's like, 
oh, well, we're, it's a proof of concept, or you could use it for pen testing. But you're really just making uh -huh. it easy for people with malintention and no skill to yes. act out. And that just means more people can do it. Oh, well. I don't understand. It's funny. You and I, and I'm sure all of our listeners, have a moral compass and just can't fathom how somebody could do this. No, it's why that that job offer from the government was so appealing. It's like, wait, you mean I could do this for the U.S. government <laughs> and get a paycheck? Still get to do it. Yeah. 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 No, I, I agree with you. It, well, and I told you uh, that I have turned down some solicitations in the past. Sure. But, yeah. you know, they knew I was able to do these things. And they said, I mean, and this was our government said, you know, we'd, we'd like you to do this. And I couldn't even do that. I'll, because just, I'll say this to anybody who might be teetering on the edge, thinking, well, I could really use the money. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm, uh, my family needs the money or whatever. If you have a moral compass, follow it. You will never go wrong. And at any point when you don't, you will regret it. And 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 it it isn't a good thing. You know, just stick with your uh, your your moral compass. Stick with your 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 moral tenets, the, your deeply held beliefs. Do what's right. Don't be tempted by what's wrong. In the meanwhile, in the meantime, as a takeaway. Um, to our listeners and to everybody you everybody we're talking to knows and loves be so oh, gosh, careful yes. Yes. about clicking links in email you know that's the way this happens that's the starting point for all of this is e a innocent looking seductive looking expected looking whatever it is i mean there there are you know this is not the nigerian prince anymore uh, th this it's gone. Nor is it, you know, your car insurance needing to be renewed. It's clever. The, the, it's the, very the, believable. It's very yes, believable. And, yes, and the problem is this means that we're we're going to see a dramatic increase in the amount of these sorts of attempts to get us to click something, and it's going to be believable, exactly as you said, Leo. But the again, it's a matter of scale, and unfortunately, this is going to cut loose a, a, a you know i've a a, a a jump in in the scale at which you know these sorts of campaigns occur i mean it's probably going to get to the point where smart people just are you know refuse to click anything in yeah. email or believe anything you see in a text message i mean yeah. i don't know about you but i i get text messages every day from Amazon and my bank and my other companies that aren't my bank <laughs> saying, you know, oh, you got to act now. Something's gone wrong. Quick, you know, call this number. And it's yeah. very easy to fall for this. I, I really, I spend almost, I think now every radio show, 10 minutes talking about this because people need to hear it and really need to gird their, you know, <laughs> prepare themselves for battle when they go out on the internet. Put your, put your armor on. It is sad. True. It's very sad. Uh, you know what's not sad? That this guy here gets a better night's sleep tonight because he did this show. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thanks for getting him to do it. Episode 888, which is the super lucky episode. You know that, right? Eight is a very lucky number. 888. Yes. Happy to have it. Yeah. Uh, you'll find uh, copies of this show in a couple of places. Steve has them. In fact, he has two unique forms of this show uh, at his website, grc.com. He's got the 16 kilobit audio, which admittedly is not, you know, hi-fi, but it is a small form factor for people who are bandwidth impaired. Uh, also, those wonderful transcripts Elaine Ferris does for every single show, which allow you to read along as you listen, to search for the part you're looking for. All of that plus 64 kilobit high quality audio available at grc.com. While you're there, check out Spinrite. The uh, for the last 20 some years, more than that, 30 years, the world's yep. finest mass storage maintenance and recovery utility. If you have storage, hard drive, or SSD, you need Spinrite. That's Steve's bread and butter. So go there and get a copy. If you buy 6.0 now, you'll get 6.1 as soon as it's done. Only slightly delayed due to this new author. 
Damn you, <laughs> silver ships. <laughs> Now that I know that, I'm not going to read that book. Uh, only slightly. Just a little bit. Just a little yeah, bit. Because I'm a fast reader and I'm still yeah, working on Spin yeah. Right. Steve's, Steve's never going to stop working. And just take a little, It's good. You need a little break, a little downtime for the brain. Let the steam <laughs> cool off a little bit. You know, at the ears. Get the smoke out of the ears. Uh, you can also find so much other stuff at Steve's site. It's worth visiting. GRC.com. Do uh, leave him feedback there if you want. GRC.com slash feedback. Or on his Twitter account. He uh, His DMs are open at SGGRC. SGGRC. We have uh, 64 kilobit audio and video of the show at our website. Twit.tv slash SN. There is a Security Now YouTube channel, which is probably the easiest way if you want to share like a little tidbit uh, with a coworker, a friend, or a boss, uh, you just snip it out of the YouTube. Makes it very easy. Uh, so look for the Security Now uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and of course, uh, you know the thing most people will end up doing is getting a podcast player and subscribing because that way you get it automatically every Tuesday afternoon, uh, the minute it's done being polished up and edited. We do the show live. If you want to get it, you know the, the soonest. You can watch us do it live at live.twit.tv. It's supposed to be 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 20.30 UTC. Depending on how long Mac Break Weekly goes, sometimes it's delayed by half an hour. So be patient. It will show up on the stream. If you're watching live, chat live at irc.twit.tv. That's uh, Tuesdays. Uh, and, of course, the chat goes on as well in our club, the Club Twig uh, Discord, Club Twit Discord. Uh, which is one of the many benefits you get from being a club member. It's only seven bucks a month, a couple of lattes a month. You get ad-free versions of every show. You get access to special shows that are only in the club because the club supports them with your membership, like Hands on Mac, Hands on Windows, the Ultimate Linux, Untitled Linux Show, uh, Stacy's Book Club, The Giz Fizz, and more. Uh, this Week in Space launched, so to speak, in the club. Uh, that's what those $7 really helps us out with. Uh, launching new shows that that aren't that are revenue zero, <laughs> regular revenue negative when they start. Uh, you also get the Twit Plus feed with lots of material before and after the shows that doesn't make it into the podcast. So, uh, highly recommend uh, Club Twit. Uh, it doesn't go in my pocket, trust me. But uh, do go to twit.tv slash Club Twit if you'd like to know more. You can also buy individual shows. If you just want Security Now ad-free, $2.99 a month. That's also at that page. Twit.tv slash Club Twit. Uh, I think that concludes this thrilling, gripping edition of uh, Silver Bad Guys. <laughs> go back to your spaceships, Steve, and we'll see you next week. we Will do, my friend, for 889 next week. Bye. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space books and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time. Yeah.